thank you all for coming and uh, thank you all for spending your lives researching this topic so that we can get accurate information um, on what is going on. So I guess to start off, um, the first question I guess I'd like, I guess let me, let me explain some of the purpose here. For some reason there seems to be a disconnect with society. Um, I've seen your lectures today, all three of you. Um, they were great, but they were tough to listen to because you basically painted a picture that the direction we're going, if we don't make changes, there are going to be consequences that people are not going to like. Um, so part of our goal is to somehow uh, at least get everyone to be aware of what you're saying so that the best of human capabilities can be focused on this. So. I'm going to ask you a lot of questions and ask you to tell us research, but the question is, I'm not the first person that's asked these questions. There's been articles written, there's been books written, you've written these books, smart people have heard this. If you're talking about such important and such urgent and such critical things, what's happened when you've told people? In other words, you're well-respected, you know, credentialed people when you've told the president, the governor, the senator, the head of the de, of wherever, what's happened? I mean, how come this isn't on the front page of the newspaper every day? Why isn't this on the, you know, the headline news every day? Why isn't everyone responding? I mean, w w you know, this information is clear. These books are very clear. They're not confusing. Why hasn't the top people heard what you said and gone on TV and said, we have a crisis and we're going to deal with it? What, what's preventing this information from being acted on by the highest levels of, of our society. Anyone who would like to respond? Well, that's, scientists aren't always the best communicators. And there are a lot of scientists out there who can't talk to the general public in terms that the general public understands. They're talking up here with highly technical terms, multisyllabic words, and they don't always make personal contact with people. Um, so that's one side of the problem. Another side of the problem is that politicians don't tend to think in the long term. I mean, these are long term things. Politician thinks in terms of two years or four years uh, because they, there's a re-election, you know. There's another campaign, another, another election. And um, this long-term stuff, they don't all see that this is so necessary to tackle. And it's easier to tackle other things. That's just a start, I could keep going, but I'll let my colleagues have something to say. Yes, uh, I, I'd agree, uh, especially with the, your second point about the uh, politicians. Uh, the reason why um, action isn't being taken urgently is, is the fact that politicians generally feel if it if it's not going to affect me in uh, and my re-election chances in the next two or three years we needn't bother with it and um it, it's a very depressing approach that they have but you can see why when they're, they're confronted with a, a mass of immediate problems uh that that they would rather kick the can down the road when it comes to something that isn't going to immediately cause a catastrophe. Uh, the trouble is that that stops being true when it does start, when, when the, the changes of climate are actually starting to cause immediate catastrophes. For instance, this last year with the, uh, uh, the hurricanes and, and uh, floods, those, those can be demonstrated to to have been exacerbated by climate change, if not caused by them. And so you, the, the massive costs involved uh, make it clear that you, 
America, for instance, can't just pretend that these things aren't happening because the, the, the balance of cost between dealing with, having to deal with catastrophes and actually not having the catastrophes because you've taken some action on a global scale, um, it be becomes, begins to become sort of glaringly obvious. So what one hopes is that the, the uh, when, when things like s go wrong faster and faster, as, as is the case, everything is, is getting wrong in an exponential way, that uh, at, the, at, at a certain point, then people will realize, in, including politicians, that you have to actually uh, take serious action serious actions which may impact your, the, uh, the way of life of people. Um, it hasn't happened yet, but it, I think it's getting close. Well, um, we're dealing with a lot of uh, um, dynamics in the situation you describe, and one of the most important ones is the institutional inertia that we have out there. Uh, uh, we are a society composed of many, many, many powerful institutions that are, you know, they're, they're organized around missions, around money, um, around all kinds of uh, rallying points for them. And uh, many of these institutions have gatekeepers who um, are dedicated to keeping messengers out of the arena if they are bearing messages that are disturbing. Uh, by the way, we see this most clearly these days on campus. And um, where the, the idea of uh, inclusion now means uh, shutting down conversations and debate. So how we got to that insane point in our culture is a kind of an interesting dynamic. Uh, there's also something like the Pareto Principle. There's actually a law named after uh, another guy whose name I forget, but it, it's sort of like the Pareto Principle of, of 80% and the 20% in, in any institution or corporation or business. 80% of the people uh, are basically devoted to the survival of the institution at all costs, and only 20% are devoted to actually carrying out the mission uh, and doing the work of the institution. So institutions themselves are powerfully motivated to maintain a status quo. Um, and um, uh, one of the things that we tend to forget in our wishfulness about the world and our, our constant uh, effort to build new utopias is that reality has mandates of its own and that uh, ultimately it will be the circumstances uh, of our lives and of reality that will probably compel us to do things differently whether we like it or not. You know, a lot of our, uh, a lot, there's a lot of thinking out there these days that th the world revolves around our preferences and likes and dislikes. And in fact, there, there are a lot of things about the universe uh, that are not concerned with our preferences and dislikes. It has its own agenda. And, uh, and our societies, of, you know, organized human societies composed of individuals have to adapt to the uh, circumstances that reality is presenting to us at a given time, or not. And also, one, one final thing. Something that's been removed from the liberal education that uh, used to be at the center of it was the idea that life is tragic. And uh, by that, I don't mean that everything comes out badly or sadly, but the idea that uh, there are consequences to the choices that we make. And, um, and uh, we, we better make good choices. And, and often we don't. And when we don't make good choices, there are consequences. I, I actually have a new theory of history, which is things happen because they seem like a good idea at the time. So I could simplify this. I've been thinking about this for a long time. And I think when it comes to climate change and ocean acidification and 
biodiversity loss and deforestation and extinction of animals and all these different things, the real question that people say in their minds is, no matter what it is you say, they say to themselves, when will this actually affect me? And as long as people say, by 2100, you've already lost them. They're like, 2100, I'm good. If, no matter what happens, if it's happening in 2100, they're good. So most people believe, no matter what you say when you talk about climate change, that you're talking about something that is still 50 plus years away. Now, we had a speaker named Guy McPherson who came, and he was, t he was simply terrifying. He was saying that um, human beings are not being accurate, and we're about to have an acceleration in climate change, which is going to affect everything and food and everything. And he was saying that we are now in an abrupt climate change, aggressive climate change. So the real reason that people are not that interested in this subject is they think you're talking about a subject that will affect us in the year, affect them in a meaningful way in 2100. So the, the question that, the horrible question that I have to ask is, okay, so with ocean acidification and overfishing and species extinction and the warming and everything, when does it affect humans? When do we go to the gross, is there not enough food? When is the storms so consistently like Puerto Rico? When are the, the tropical malaria coming to here? When do we get to the point that our society is significantly interfered with? Because if you say it's 100 years away, 50 years away, you know, a lot of people are gonna be relieved. How much time do we have before all these things create significant interference in our ability to feed ourselves and have a normal society? And it's a horrible question, but that's the, that's the real thing that people don't want to know but want to know. I should think that Hurricane Sandy and Harvey and Irma and Maria and a bunch of other and Katrina should have hit a lot of people where they live. Uh, you know, things have happened, and there is going to be, they're going to run out of water in Cape Town, South Africa. I mean, there's all sorts of things that are happening now. Uh, perhaps it didn't happen in your town or your state, but certainly there have been many major major things that have happened and are going to continue to happen in an even uh, more severe way. Uh, you know, if we have to appeal to people only by what's personally going to happen to you, unless people have some thoughts about their kids or grandkids that they're concerned about their future or concerned about the rest of the life on the planet, um, I, I find it very frustrating if I have to tell each individual person, you know, something bad will happen to you, because that may not at all be the case. Um, yes, a couple of points on, on, uh, on what you just said. Uh, one uh, is the speed at which things are happening in climate change is in itself increasing. If most of the changes now are exponential. The, the growth of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere um, and the, the, the rate of rise of sea level, for instance, global sea levels, these are increasing exponentially, not, not linearly. And the, tr the thing about an exponential, as uh, some, somebody said, is that if you're standing on an exponential curve and you look behind you, it's all flat and, and and doesn't look as if much is happening. So therefore, you needn't worry very much because nothing much has happened so far. Um, and But when you look ahead, you're going up a vertical cliff. Um, and most people prefer to look at what's happened so far and they sort of think, well, nothing much has happened, we're okay. Um, and that's that's the sort of, dis dis that's the, uh, uh, the problem with an exponential change is that you don't realize it's happening until it's too late. Um, and then the inverse of that was a, a, a quite a, a astonishing statement that came from a British government minister when, when the last uh, assessment of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change came out. Um, he said 
well, I've seen this report, and, and it's, only, it's only forecasting a sort of two and a half degrees of warming, and half of that's already happened. And in other words, what he thought was that because the IPCC projections only go out to the year 2000, uh, sorry, 2100, that therefore climate change would stop in 2100. So if half of the w climate change is ever going to happen has already happened, uh, and therefore we don't have to worry because when we get to 2100, uh, climate change will stop. So that, that was this astonishing British government minister now no longer in office. But uh, it illustrates the way politicians think. Okay. Um, one of the dynamics that we're dealing with uh, is the fact that uh, uh, systems theory really applies to many of the, the forces that are now in motion around us. And, and, you know, what systems theory will tell us is that systems tend to keep on doing what they do until they reach a point of criticality and then they go through what's called phase change where you know they move from one state to another often a state of, st of ap apparent stability to wild instability um, this is obvious in nature but it's probably also uh, you know going to prove to be obvious in, in in human social dynamics and the way that we're responding to these things uh, and you know the the short answer to that is that we probably won't be moved to do much of anything until we're compelled to, and then it will all be a very impromptu process. You know, the, the, there are two forms of extreme psychological uh, narcissism that I observe around me today. One of them is what I call techno-narcissism. You know, the idea that uh, we're going to come up with technological rescue remedies that will uh, make everything all right. And the other type is organizational narcissism, where we think we're going to organize our way through this set of predicaments. And I'm more inclined to think that uh, society being the emergent phenomenon that they are, phenomena that they are, suggests that um, you know, they are self-organizing and they, they will respond to the circumstances that the time and place presents. And sometimes it's a very disorderly reaction. So disorder is one of the options here. Uh, it, to, for us, one of the questions really is, you know, that we ought to put to the, to the people, to the nation, is, well, how much disorder do you want? So I guess the, the question that I want to just ask is, um, again, are we having climate change or are we having abrupt climate change? Meaning, are, you, are we saying that you know, this is a bad thing and by 2050 sea levels are gonna rise and by 2070, or are you saying, no, people aren't understanding, it is accelerating too fast. In, in other words, there's, there's a, a simple question I could ask to say differently. I could just say, how many degrees can the planet heat up and humans can survive and how many degrees did we go up last year? So if you're saying we can only go up six degrees Celsius, and we went up a tenth of a percent, that would mean there's only 60 years left that you could be. So I'm trying to understand, are we dealing with a problem that is very bad and we've got to solve over the next 50 plus years? Or are we dealing with a problem that's very bad that literally um, could prevent us from continuing as a species in the next 15 years? I'm trying to understand the, how advanced this is, and I don't want to overreact, and I don't want to be scary. On the other hand, I don't want to be um, falsely optimistic that this is a problem for uh, my children. I, I think um, it's about halfway in between um, something that's going to do a sin in 50 years or something that's going to do a sin in 15 years. But uh, it, it's, it's uh, the problem is that, that the, it's this acceleration effect that um, we've already got more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere than will cause a two degree warming. 
and the the reason why the, the, the two degree figure was pulled out of pulled out it was pulled out of the air to some extent uh, as it had there had to be some temperature rise that was regarded as acceptable and some value that was regarded as unacceptable and so to some extent this was a political figure but it also there was a real there was a, a reality behind it in that if you warm the climate by more than two degrees there's a lot of crops which start to to give very much lower yields and, and wither away so there'd be a real uh, crisis in global food production if we warm up beyond two degrees and a lot of other effects as well in the rate of of sea level rise will increase very fast but the, the but the trouble is we already have enough carbon dioxide in the atmosphere to take us beyond two degrees it, it's because the the warming is is not instantly realized it takes years for that extra carbon dioxide to exert its effect through the climate system but even if we never emit any more um, we'll get our two degrees of, of warming and all the consequences from it. So we're on a, there's a kind of flywheel or ratchet which is, which is driving us on. Uh, and I think the, the fear of the people who are very uh, pessimistic about our future is that if we don't really do something very, very serious to stop things, that's what will happen. And you can, you can have a, see a timetable at which various uh, irreversible effects will have happened. And, and it's, the, it's the business as usual scenario, which they, the intergovernmental panel stopped using because it sounded too bad. But in fact, it's in their scenarios of how the future will go, they, they, they have an optimistic one when we become sane and rational and we, uh, uh, stop emitting carbon dioxide. There's a business as usual one, and then there's a let's let rip on everything scenario, a sort of Donald Trump type scenario. So their early uh, assessments of, the, of what's happening to the planet had three scenarios, and then, then they thought that was too easy. People would understand that and might get really worried, so they deliberately complicated things later. But on the business as usual scenario, which is the one that we're following, which is we're not... That the, the rate of rise of CO2 and other gases is as if we weren't doing anything uh, to stop it, it is just letting it uh, go its own way. But that on that, that scenario, you can, you can plot out at which year we reach certain numbers of degrees of warming, and at the moment it, it's, it's, it's having us get about four to five degrees of warming by the end of the century, which... Um, it may not wipe us out as a species, as, uh, uh, as a, um, the most pessimistic people would say, but it, it would make it would wipe us out as a civilized species. We would be at, at four to five degrees of warming. The, the large areas of the planet would become very di uninhabitable. There would be uh, deserts where where the present a lot of southern Europe would become a desert. And, and you can see how the world, w the human race, would have a great deal of difficulty in, in surviving as a, as a functioning uh, organism in, in, in that time. And that's, that's the end of the, s the century. And, and the bad things would be happening way, way before that. So probably we are talking about, say, 20 years before we have such serious consequences that we really notice and of course we're really noticing this, y this year from various disasters i just want to add to that um the effects of sea level rise are already being seen in small island nations that are um you know not mountainous but flat uh island nations that realize within a few decades they're going to be underwater and some of them are making plans to move to higher islands and um, that give up their homeland i mean this is their country and they know they're not going to have it anymore so we are going to have not only those people 
but people fleeing from places that will have gotten too hot to grow crops. We're going to have climate refugees. I mean, we have enough issues about refugees now. Uh, there are some people that argue that a lot of the Syrian issues were because of climate problems. That's, you know, some people think that's true and some people don't. But there will be undoubtedly huge numbers of climate refugees within the next few decades. And, and what that will do with international politics or wars or whatever, who knows? <clears throat> There's a, uh, a third intellectual conceit that I forgot to mention, uh, along with the techno-narcissism and organizational narcissism. There's an idea that, uh, and it, you know, it comes from um, uh, the, uh, obviously comes from sort of the technocratic and scientific uh, uh, sector, but I think it's a sort of a dangerous idea, the idea that if you can measure enough stuff, you can control everything. And we're finding out now that, uh, yeah, we can measure a lot of things, you know, and, th and then we're disappointed that we, that we can't control it or that we can't rouse up enough of a political, of a potent enough political mechanism to change our behavior. Um, I don't think that any amount of hand-wringing about these issues is going to help that situation. Um, and there's some funny elements of it, too, that, that have to do with uh, the, uh, uh, the, the intellectual life of our culture. You know, uh, how many of you are familiar with Nassim Taleb, author of The, the um, Black Swan and Fooled by Randomness and other books? Never heard of the Black Swan, huh? Well, um, Taleb has a new um, uh, phrase that he's been using to describe the behavior of the intellectual classes in, in America. He, he refers to them as intellectual yet idiots. People who are obviously highly educated and highly intelligent, and yet they behave like, like idiots. And uh, I, I've seen a couple of really uh, uh, vivid examples of that in my travels in recent years. One, and they're institutional, uh, so they should be of interest to us. If we're interested why institutions are not functioning well enough to bring these issues uh, I into the arena, uh, one of them is the Rocky Mountain Institute, you know, a, v a very famous and highly esteemed environmental organization. They had a program back in the early 2000s to develop a hypercar, as they called it. This was going to be their solution to the, uh, the problem of happy motoring and climate change and warming and too much CO2 in the atmosphere. They were going to develop cars that got such wonderful, supernaturally great mileage that we would be able to continue living the suburban happy motoring life uh, because we'd have better cars. And this was from an environmental organization uh, of people who were considered to be major intellectuals in, you know, in, in, in our country. Amory Lovins in, particularly, in particular, who runs the organization. You know, nobody stopped to ask themselves, you know, does this idea of the hypercar, what, it, what, what is its net effect? The net effect is that it promotes the idea that we can continue living the way we're living now in this insane suburban living arrangement, you know, and that was an environmental organization. So, you know, one of the lessons of that, I'm starting to ramble on, but I do want to make this point. Um, one of the lessons of that is if you can't depend on the, the you know, the highly accredited uh, intellectuals in your culture to think clearly, who, you can, who are you going to rely on? Huh? You know, the, just the boobs at the corner bar. You know, the guy sitting in the gutter with a bottle of Muscatel. You know, some dumb politician. You know, so w what we're seeing is tremendous failure in the intellectual life of our country. I saw another really wonderful kind of amusing example in Houston. Uh, I, I gave a spiel at Rice University, and it was sponsored by the environmental uh, school there, which had been the School of Forestry previously. And uh, so they took me on a tour of the facilities at the environmental school. And he here's what they were doing. It was summer, and so they had to air condition 
most of the building to a supernatural level of coolness in order to keep the computers happy. And then they had to turn the heat on so people could work in this environment. And these were the environmental professors at Rice University. You know, these weren't the janitors, you know, who made this decision. So if you can't depend on those people to think clearly, uh, I, I, I'd say that we're pretty lost. Okay, I'm gonna ask some specific questions. Um, so I'm gonna ask a bunch of them so you could try to just give three minute answers and we'll try to run through a lot of points that I want people to hear. So how will climate change affect the world's food supply and when will this start happening? Anyone who, want, anyone who wants to answer that? Um, well, the, 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 the graphs of productivity of the various, of the major constituents like maize and rice show that um, we can, in case of rice, we can have about one degree more warming and then the yield goes down. Um, so once we, once we warm beyond another one degree, yields will go down and yields are going, will, will start going down on all the major um, food sources at a time when the population's going up. And one of the frightening things which I, statistic I, I dug out, but it's in a UN report and it seems unbelievable, but um, it's uh, predictions of, of population by the end of this century and the they do it by region, and this, this is an official UN report. And the, the predictions from most parts of the world are something like a 30% increase. That, now, that's, that's pretty serious anyway, because we've got to find 30% more food. But Europe, the population will actually go down a bit. But Africa is going to quadruple. And um, this is going from sort of 1 billion or so to 4 billion. And um, Africa's already a continent which can't feed itself, and it's very dependent on food aid. Um, for instance, American food aid, which has dried up because the, the, the maize that, that, that was used to, to send to Africa in the case of famine is now being turned into biofuel to power SUVs. Um, so you've got a, a massively accelerating population, at least according to the UN predictions, for in, in parts of the world which are least able to feed themselves. And then you've got a decrease in yields of all the fundamental foods. So uh, the collision between those two is, is, is already starting to happen. And um, it, will, it will become more serious as the temperature gets beyond the one degree warmer than it is now, because that's when yields will start to go down. Um, I, I think that it's self-evident that, uh, in fact, we're not going to feed the, this new cohort of people who are theoretically coming along. Of course, um, it, it's true that people uh, have sex under conditions of hardship and, the, and that so that they, they will probably reproduce. You know, there's kind of an overhang for the population growth. As, as we encounter these problems with um, feeding the world and all of the other environmental problems and economic problems that grow out of this series of dilemmas, uh, you know, it's gonna create a lot of hardship in the world and already is. Um, and I agree with what you said about the, um, you know, the Syrian refugee problem is, Probably a, a large part of it has to do with the fact that they've, they've been having uh, water problems in Syria and, and uh, they can't feed themselves. Uh, at the same time that uh, their revenue from oil went way down over the last decade. Uh, they didn't have much of it to begin with, but now they have none to, to uh, export. Um, but I'm, I'm not, you know, I, I'm not convinced that uh, uh, sooner or later, th this problem is going to uh, resolve itself by there being less people, fewer people. And we're probably not going to find a way to feed this hypothetical new cohort of, of newcomers. Uh, we're, it's not just climate change. You know, we are going to face problems with 
the fossil fuel herbicides and fertilizers and pesticides that were are enabling the uh, uh, the extra food to have been created. You know, we're, there's a lot of uh, jabber about the green revolution that began in the 1960s and 70s, but it had much more to do with just our ability to pour fossil fuel soil amendments on the on the ground than it did with coming up with new strains of grain that produced you know, higher yields. And um, we're going to run out of, uh, uh, or we're going to have trouble with all of those fossil fuel products. So there will be fewer people. And, and um, I it's only one of the disorders that, uh, w that we face that we're going to have some choices about. But one of the things that we can do is, uh, I mean, we, we, it, w it would be possible to have a conscious policy in our country for dismantling industrial agriculture and rebuilding smaller scale agriculture uh, where smaller farms were better cared for by more people with, with the less intervention of machines and less, you know, more bi biodynamic practice. Uh, but clearly we don't want to do it. You know, we, we, we can't be dragged kicking and screaming to do things that are going to eventually be better for us. And, and so, uh, uh, you know, we're kind of stuck with the consequences of doing nothing. How is climate change a national security issue to the United States? I, just, I don't know if I can mention a, an example uh, that uh, in the year 2000, when uh, nobody was accepting that the Arctic ice was disappearing um, except the Department of Defense um, because they, the, they made the, the one climate modeler who was predicting uh, a very rapid decline in the sea ice, who was using a very, very powerful computer in Monterey, um, was the one who had the ear of the Department of Defense. So in the, the year 2000, they had um, a big symposium called um, uh, studying the consequences of a, the, the, the military consequences or defense consequences of an ice-free Arctic. So this, this word, ice-free Arctic, in the year 2000 really was amazing to, to stand most sort of standard scientists. You know, what, what's this ice-free Arctic they're talking about? But that was because the Department of Defense was ahead of everybody else in seeing what was happening in the world, that, that they certainly were aware of this decline of the sea ice. And so they wanted to, to uh, be able to control the Arct this ice-free Arctic. So they, they realized it was a challenge because you had to go there and occupy to control it and patrol it. Uh, so they needed to know that the ice was going to disappear because that creates more ocean for, for the Navy to have to control. Um, so, in a sense, the, the Department of Defense had to be realistic about climate change in a way that other branches of the government didn't have to. They could get away with this kind of fantasies that it wasn't really very serious and so on. But, but the Department of Defense, of all people, ha uh, turned out to be the one department that actually realistically understood and accepted the rate of climate change because it impinged on on defense needs. So um, it, it's a kind of strange, uh, sort of s strange counterintuitive thought that, that, that they're, they're the most realistic department in the United States government. The U.S. Navy has lots of facilities in Norfolk, Virginia. And Norfolk, Virginia is kind of like Miami in terms of being underwater even when it's not raining sometimes. And the Navy is quite aware that their facilities are in peril and it's going to cost them a lot of money to pick up and move inland, but they're going to eventually have to do that. How has uh, global warming, climate change affected uh, uh, geopolitical turmoil? Is that, is that the question? Uh. How is climate change a national security issue to the, the United States? But you can well, an answer it how you like. It's obvious that uh, uh, the conditions in the world today 
are generating a lot of ill feeling. And much of that ill feeling is coming from people who feel that they are not getting the resources that they deserve. And we are having a scramble for resources around the world, especially food and water and energy. And those three things are going to become uh, even more, uh, pose more difficult challenges as the years go, go by. There's going to be a, a fourth one that will, that will join those in the scarcity uh, uh, arena, and that's uh, capital. Because we, we've been uh, functioning with a, a, a lot of capital that actually isn't really there. It's, it's uh, imaginary, hallucinated wealth. And that's going to vanish too. You know, you look at the Middle East and you see a region of the world that is one of the most inhospitable places for human settlement. And yet, you've had some of the greatest population surges in Saudi Arabia and the Emirates and uh, many of the other uh, Middle East and North African countries and, and uh, uh, Western a Asian nations. The greatest population growth in that part of the world. And, you know, it, it's almost entirely due to the oil wealth that they generated uh, over the last 60, 80 years. And when their ability to generate that wealth goes away, a place like Saudi Arabia is going to become a, a very, very difficult to get by. You know, I think that that's one of the things that's driving the beginnings of disorder in the Saudi kingdom and in, in, in the royal uh, hierarchy in Saudi Arabia now, which is obviously undergoing a, a pretty severe change with uh, Prince Mohammed bin Salman. And um, uh, so the prospects for places like that are pretty, pretty grim. And uh, they've already uh, generated tremendous amounts of refugees. They will probably generate more as the situation becomes more severe. And uh, I have no idea how we're going to sort that out. Uh, although I think that we're going to see rather harsh policies. We, I think we're going to see countries make a conscious decision that, you know what, we cannot take in every uh, poor person, every poor suffering person in the world who wants to get out of some terrible part of the world. We just can't do it. And it's going to be kind of a human lifeboat situation. So um, it'll be tough. How much have wildfires increased in the last 50 years, and is this because of climate change? Well, I don't, I don't know the numbers, but I, I did spend the last six months in Southern California, so uh, <laughs> was <laughs> was surrounded by them. And uh, what what the local people say is that one of the things that's made them worse is the fact that uh, the people building houses out in in remote spots, because people like to live in remote spots, and um, these are in areas which naturally would burn through from time to time because of the the the, the brush catching fire and being it's a it's a white nature's way of of sort of cleansing the uh, the area but because people are building high priced houses there the fire the, the firefighters would always do their best to 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 stop stop any fires that broke out and the result is things will build up to a, a, a very large um, a, a very large head of, of um, and then it will burst out in something uncontrollable. So it's, it's man, it's, it man has had something to doing with it because of his tendency to try and settle everywhere uh, with um, building his houses in, in, in the middle of the, of the countryside. Uh, let me just say that I've been uh, around uh, out west, and I've seen some interesting manifestations of this. The, uh, because uh, the uh, because the, the we've had some weather changes, climate changes in the west that have allowed additional generations of particular beetles um, produce another generation during one season. Um, they've created a tremendous problem with uh, the pine bark beetle 
in particular. So when you go out to Colorado, New Mexico, and actually uh, clear up into British Columbia in the Kelowna region of the, the Antonagan region of British Columbia, and even up into Alaska, you know, you see tremendous damage to the pine trees. You see all these r rusty colored red pine trees on the hillsides in the Rocky Mountains. And these are all pine trees that are dying because beetles are having another generation uh, to reproduce during one particular summer. So, and, you know, th this is only one of the manifestations of this, but I'm sure that there are, you know, thousands, tens of thousands, or maybe millions of effects like this that we, we don't, we don't, we're not aware of, we don't measure, we, we don't notice. What insect-borne diseases will the United States have to deal with as climate change continues? I didn't hear that. What insect-borne diseases will the United States have to deal with as climate change continues? I can't list them for you, but I can tell you that the things that are further south currently will be moving north. Uh, all kinds of agricultural pests, tree diseases, human diseases, they're all going to be moving north. So look forward to Zika and some of those other goodies coming up here. And various tree parasites. There's a very nice book. Um, uh, called Experimenting with a Small Planet by William Hayes, who lives in Colorado. And uh, it's, it's a kind of compendium of, of all the things that are happening, uh, explained in a, in a, in a very abu a nice way. And uh, um, he ends up with saying, well, we need, we need a terrible disease because exponential growth on a finite planet can't continue forever, and the the quickest way in the end that, that that growth is going to be stopped is a very very serious epidemic, uh, which will like back the Great Plague uh, or the Black Death, something that will come in from a start out somewhere in Africa, and unlike other ones that have been contained, won't be contained, and and that will at some stage is likely to be what would happen and would then uh, be the final control over this kind of endless exponential growth of everything. So that would be probably an insect-borne disease. Yeah, we have a lot, we, we've already seen a lot and we probably have a lot more to look forward to. You know, we've seen dengue fever moving north and uh, West Nile virus. Um, some of the uh, old usual suspects that that, ha that have been apparently under control for a while, uh, you know, typh typhoid fever, yellow fever, malaria, which at one time was uh, actually very common in, in Dixieland and throughout the Ohio Valley and the Mississippi Valley. Um, uh, but uh, they're coming back strong, and they're coming back strong at a time when we're beginning to have pretty severe problems with uh, uh, antibiotic uh, potency. So not only do we uh, uh, have the, to, we can look forward to the, uh, the spread of uh, new diseases and old friends uh, diseases, uh, but we're going to have a lot more trouble treating them. And, and as, uh, of course, this will happen at the same time that our gigantic, overblown, over outscaled um, uh, experiment in racketeering known as the health care industry um, begins to dissolve and uh, it's going to be a lot harder to manage this on the clinic level than uh, you know than maybe before we also have some uh, newcomers on the scene we have uh, Ebola and Marburg which uh, uh, coming out of um, the heart of Africa and uh, we're seeing larger and larger epidemics of of Ebola, and uh, uh, the story with AIDS is a little hard to fix in relation to climate change. I mean, it, it, there's a, I, I think there's reason to believe that uh, it was present in uh, at least the 1940s. Um, I think I even read that the 
the frozen man that they found in the glacier in Switzerland, uh, whose nickname is Utzi. You know, he was like a 5,000-year-old uh, uh, Neolithic uh, or Paleolithic, I don't, I'm not even sure, character who uh, was preserved in this glacier that he actually had, had signs of um, uh, uh, mo uh, many modern diseases in his system, including uh, Lyme disease. So, uh, and Lyme disease, where I come from, is now, an, uh, you know, up in the upper Hudson Valley is an unbelievable plague. Um, it's hard not to run into people in your social circle who have had terrible problems with it, and many of them are disabled. And, uh, but, you know, from the policy level, we, c you know, we can't even, we can't even change the medical standards of practice and protocols for the treatment of AIDS to make it a treatable disease in the Hudson Valley in America. So if we're not able to do that, to arrive at some rational idea of what actually a useful treatment would be other than, you know, three weeks of doxycycline, then, uh, you know, how are we going to solve these problems? How has species extinction changed in the last 50 how has species extinction changed in the last 50 years, and what is projected to happen over the next 25 to 50 years? How has species extinction, extinction of animals and um, insects and spe different species other than humans, changed in the last 50 years, and what is projected to happen over the next 25 to 50 years? Before people were around, there were five great extinctions that went in the history of life on this planet. Uh, one of them you may have read about, the asteroid meteor thing that fell in the Yucatan area into the water and caused the major climate change because of all the stuff that went into the atmosphere and that was considered responsible for the demise of the dinosaurs. So that's many different species of dinosaurs went extinct within, you know, not the next year, but within thousands of years after that because of the effects of that. And there were other caused by natural things. Uh, we are now in what many people consider the age of the sixth extinction and there was a book written called The Sixth Extinction, and I can't remember her name who wrote it, if somebody can remind me. Um, I'm drawing a blank Elizabeth on Colbert. Elizabeth Colbert, thank you. Um, an excellent book uh, in which she documents what is going on now, and this one, unlike the five earlier ones, this is not being caused by natural changes, it's being caused by what humans are doing um, to the planet. And it's happening now and it will be getting worse as things go on, unless people acknowledge it and take major steps to try to uh, reverse it. There's a, um, another feature of the current extinction that's particularly worrisome. Previous extinctions have taken a tremendous toll on various forms of animal life. The current extinction seems to be taking a much greater toll on plant life, plant species diversity, than some of the previous extinctions have. And given the importance of plants <laughs> as a foundation for, uh, um, for life on Earth with regard to ecological processes and as, as well as uh, medicinal products and uh, agricultural pro pro products, the the loss of plant diversity is, in some ways, of, of very particular concern. Losing dinosaurs sort of breaks the heart of 10-year-olds, um, understandably. Um, but losing um, plant diversity, particularly in the tropics, is something that uh, is a legacy that we're, we're, we're going to have to live or die with for, for many centuries to come. In what ways does the fossil fuel industry use its financial might to influence laws and policies that are detrimental to the health of people on the planet? In, in what ways does the fossil fuel industry use its financial might to influence laws and policies that are detrimental to the health of people on the planet? 
Well, perhaps I just said, answered in two words, the Koch brothers. Uh, they are fossil fuel, they are pouring millions of dollars to elect climate deniers to public office, including the climate denier in chief who has uh, pulled us out of the Paris Agreement, taken down uh, all sorts of um, websites about climate change in, in the federal agencies, has, uh, I, could, I can't remember all of it, but there are many dozens of things, policies, not necessarily laws, but regulations that have been done away with or just not enforced, dealing with uh, thinking of uh, the government taking climate into consideration when making policies. They are done an incredibly efficient in the past year of undoing uh, environmental protections in this country, particularly with regard to climate, but also with regard to other things. Uh, the American Petroleum Institute sent Trump or Pruitt, maybe it was to Pruitt, a list of eight things that they would like to have done and within the first, before the first year of the administration was done, they had done six of the eight things that the American Petroleum Institute asked them to do. Um, you know, the, the oil industry uh, uh, really operates as the, the, the uh, the servants of a population who demand to have a, as much oil as they want to have. So, uh, you know, I, I'm not sure that it uh, makes a whole lot of sense to demonize the industry. You know, getting back to the, uh, the failures of the environmental intellectuals among us, um, the sovereign remedy for the problem of using too much oil in, in uh, a society uh, would be to do everything possible to create walkable communities, you know, uh, and we have no interest in that whatsoever in America. You know, it's man of, you know, the thing that uh, is, is so interesting is, you know, you see people from Minnesota going on vacation to uh, France and Italy, and they have a wonderful time in these fantastic walkable towns. You know, you don't have to get into a car for 11 days and you're, you're walking everywhere and it's fabulous. And then they go back to Mankato and they do every damn thing possible to destroy their towns. You know, they, they, they widen Main Street to, to be a six laner. You know, they, uh, they knock down all the street trees because they're impediments to motoring. You know, this is the behavior of the people in our culture. So, uh, um, uh, uh, you know, we could get our heads screwed on straighter about that. The, the interesting thing to me about the Amory Lovins paradox of the Rocky Mountain Institute and their stupid hypercar is that they didn't have any interest at all in walkable communities. You know, and, and I know for a fact because I was on the scene at the Aspen Institute when uh, you know, some of my new urbanist colleagues were trying to debate with Amory Love and, you know, and say, you know, why can't you get interested in walkable communities and better urban design and, and recreating a landscape that actually has a distinction between the town and the country? So you know, we're not living in this suburban clusterfuck. And he wasn't interested in the least. You know, and neither was his organization, his institution. So, uh, uh, you know, there's a great institutional lack of regard f from the good guys, the guys who are supposed to be the good guys. And I think that's a tragic situation for us, and it needs to be recognized. Can I just disagree with you that there's no interest in walkable cities? Uh, I live, we live in New York City, and we now have bike paths along many streets and avenues where they didn't exist before. We have, um, when, when Bloomberg was mayor, cars are now not allowed anywhere around the Times Square area. And the High Line, the, right, there's all sorts of walkable things going on in New York City which is, you know, about as much of a city as, I mean, it's the biggest city in the country. 
But notice um, it didn't come from the environmental community. It came from, you know, Mr. Bloomberg. Mr. Bloomberg is, works with the environmental community. And there are, are similar things going on in New England. Our son is involved as a transportation planner with, uh, with, with work in Rhode Island and Connecticut towns making bike paths and walking areas. So things are happening. Nowhere near fast enough, but you shouldn't make such an extreme statement that there's no interest, because there is interest. It's just not happening fast. Well, I, I'd also suggest that you're, I would agree that we ought not to demonize corporations because I don't think corporations are immoral. Um, I think they're amoral. Corporations have one function. We created them. Their one function is to return profits to their shareholders. Um, their only duty is fiduciary. And so it's the responsibility of a corporation to do what we made it to do, which is to make money. It's the responsibility of government um, to regulate the corporations. But now we're in this situation in which the corporations are gaining greater and greater control over the democratic process. Um, and they do that in, in, in basically through political campaign donations, $18 billion a year from the fossil fuel industry into American political campaigns, $150 million a year just in Washington lobbying. That's more money from the fossil fuel companies in lobbying in Washington, D.C., not more, almost more money than Wall Street and the defense industry put together. Um, and so I think it's, it's actually the collusion of corporate interests and the democratic uh, system that really is the, is the frightening part to me. Um, the regulators are now in bed with the regulated, and if, if that's going to happen, then what we're going to see are these two changes. That is, as was discussed earlier, uh, an erosion of regulation and an increase in the amount of political control that corporations, not just energy, but other corporations, big pharma, et cetera, um, have over um, EPA, over FDA. Um, and that, that is, is a frightening uh, future for me. I think that's a frightening future for democracy. I want to add something to this about this, uh, the, um, the corporate money in America. Um, Many of us are familiar with the Citizens United Supreme Court case of, I think, 2010, or 9 or 10. And that was the court case that basically said that uh, corporations have the same privileges as, as uh, citizens to express their political uh, predilections by using money as a form of speech. And this was such a wrong-headed decision and such a bad idea for the following reason, which I think ought to be self-evident, which is that, that corporations don't have the same duties and obligations and responsibilities to the public interest that citizens do, a and explicitly so. They, as you said, they uh, are uh, uh, explicitly responsible only to their shareholders and their boards of directors. So the idea that uh, they uh, deserve to be treated the same as human citizens is absurd on the face of it. And the real problem with that, for me, and it's one of the reasons why, uh, as a registered Democrat, I'm disgusted with the Democratic Party, is that President Obama could have mounted some kind of a campaign of some sort, whether it was, you know, together with the then uh, democratically control Congress to revisit the question of corporate personhood and re-legislate it or even create a constitutional amendment redefining what corporate personhood was to make it distinct from the, the personhood of citizens. And we failed to do it at that time. And nobody has challenged him about that or, or challenged you know, what is now you know, a, a historical incident that time is, is passing by. So, you know, it, it's, uh, you know, you'd be criticizing history. But um, to me, it was a tremendous blunder, and it shows something so tremendous about the lack of, of an ability to think in this country among the, the, the thinking classes that it's just a staggering outcome. Um, well, uh, just going back to the, the actual question of the industry and 
what it's spending <coughs> as mer the merchants of doubt, which is to spread, spread doubt about uh, the harmfulness of global warming so that people will keep on using fossil fuels. I think a lot of it is, and the fact that it's become more virulent, more money being spent, more success being achieved because they've captured the government, basically, um, is fear. I, mean, I think there's fear by the industry that they're becoming irrelevant. They're becoming like the sort of whale oil industry or the gas mantle industry because they're seeing that people are finding ways more and more of living without oil. And especially, for instance, electric cars coming along. Um, if you can, if you can, if people can tolerate, I mean, I was amazed, again, living in Southern California to see Los Angeles freeways, and you're appalled at the fact that the, the planet is being sort of destroyed by the emissions from all these millions of cars that are rushing around uh, to no good purpose. But today, you look at those cars, and a lot of them are electric, and you can, it, the, the people still living out their sort of infantile passion with the, with the automobile, but it's not an infantile passion with, with the internal combustion engine, it's infantile passion with a, a thing that will go wherever they want, whenever they want to do it. So they can, they, so the oil industry is frightened that, that their biggest consumer, that is the, the driver, might be able to drive something that doesn't need petrol. And the other thing that frightens them is the environmental movement and, uh, and the fact that if something is done about global change, then we have the analysis of, of what's going on by the Intergovernmental Panel and then everybody else is that um, we have to, to leave in the about 70% of the remaining oil that we know about in the ground if we're going to avoid uh, climate warming that goes beyond this two degree limit. So if the world suddenly did become serious about climate change, if they really did pursue the Paris Agreement uh, meticulously, then the, a lot of the remaining oil would have to stay in the ground. And all that oil has been discovered and it's, it's in the reserves of, of Shell and ExxonMobil. And if you're going to say suddenly the world is going to tell the oil industry you have to leave that asset in the ground, then the oil industry will collapse because their, their chief asset is being taken away from them. They can't drill that stuff out of the ground. Um, so the, f the fear is that people might sideline oil um, and that they might be ordered not to use it anymore by the, by the people of the world. So that they're, they're really, I think, frightened, and that's fear breeds um, uh, ir irrational actions. Um, so that, that might be behind some of what the oil industry is doing, although um, most of it, I think, is simply protecting their positions um, in, in a world that's, that's changing all the time. I want to just put maybe a small damper on electric cars. Um, I was sort of tickled when they were coming out and they had these stickers on them that said zero emissions as if electricity flowed out of the wall. <laughs> and, uh, you know, more and more electricity is being produced by solar and wind, but still the vast majority of electricity is produced by burning coal and natural gas. And electric cars can be more efficient in terms of its emissions, but um, most electric cars you know, ultimately um, are, are powered by coal and natural gas in a more efficient way, certainly than an internal combustion engine, but, but for, for the vast majority of those cars, they have not broken uh, free from uh, fossil fuel industry. I think it's a move in the right direction. It's an exciting direction. I don't wanna, don't wanna suggest that it's not a positive move, but, um, but I think we have to be honest with ourselves that, um, you know, when you, when you drive your electric car, you're, you're pretty much driving a coal-powered car. Has the, all the information about hy hydraulic fracturing 
that the public has been told been accurate? Is there any reason to think that the public is not getting accurate information about hydraulic fracturing and its risks? Well, the, uh, there's certainly a, a number of risks associated with uh, pumping vast amounts of uh, water and, and at propants into the into the well bores, and you know we're seeing a lot of earthquakes in Oklahoma where they didn't have a whole lot of earthquakes before. Um, I think what's more kind of dangerous is the delusional thinking that's coming from the shale oil miracle, and. Uh, some of them are expressed in terms like we're energy independent now. You know, uh, the, it, it simply represents a, a misunderstanding of what shale oil is about. And as I said in an earlier talk today, um, these wells uh, are are, com are completely unlike the conventional oil wells that we basically built our system a on. Um, they uh, they deplete very rapidly. Within about three or four years, they're done. Um, they produce about 80 to 100 barrels a day uh, compared to the thousands of barrels a day that Texas uh, oil produced in the 1940s or 50s. Uh, and it's a completely different scene. What's really different, however, is the financial arrangements around shale oil. Shale oil is a manifestation of the low interest rate, high debt regime that we've been in for the last 10 years. And in fact, um, share the shale oil industry wasn't even ramped up until it actually absolutely coincides with the great financial crisis of 2008. And that's when the ramp up of shale oil begins. But it's also the beginning of a 10 year regime of supernaturally low interest rates that have allowed us to generate enormous amounts of debt um, at, at artificially low interest rates. To, uh, to run an industry that has not made a red cent uh, since it started. The, the shale oil industry is not making any money at all, and sooner or later they're going to run into a wall with their financing. Um, and um, you know, they have to keep on drilling relentlessly to even keep the production up. And I think that what you're gonna see is the outcome will be extremely disappointing for, uh, for this country. You know, it's going to come as a great shock in four or five years when they watch the shale oil industry collapse. Yeah, I would, I guess I would add to that that I'm not sure how much of what we're being told is false. Um, I am sure that we're not being told very much of what's out there. For instance, um, try to find out what chemicals are being pumped into that frack, right? Um, well, a lot of that is, is uh, considered trade secret. Um, yeah. In the state of Wyoming, for instance, uh, the public can't know. State of Pennsylvania, I think, the public can't know. Um, and so uh, what the industry will often say is, well, there's no evidence of any harm. Well, if there's no data, there's probably not gonna be any evidence, and so that's a self-fulfilling prophecy and a very worrisome one, in fact. Um, you know, and we, we need to back up, too, and remember that fracking via the Halliburton loophole was excluded from the Clean Air and Clean Water Act, right? So the very regulations that would have given us, that when I talk to my students, right, they just are, are, are just dumbfounded that there was a time in this country in which the insecticide, pesticide industry was, was unregulated, right? They just scratched that, that can't be the case said, oh, no, you could spray this stuff on crops and, you know, you didn't have to. And they said, wow, that is amazing. So throughout their whole lives, you know, there's been an EPA. And so they just assume, right, that you can't spray things into the environment without, without government oversight. And here we are pumping chemical. I mean, I know in 20 years we're going to tell the student stories like, did you know there was a time in which we could pu pump massive amounts of undisclosed chemicals Right? with the potential for the contamination of our groundwater, and we allowed the industry to do that without even telling us what those chemicals were. Um, that, that is going to be one of the most environmentally jaw-dropping failures, I think, of, of, of my generation. What is geoengineering, and is this a good idea? 
<laughs> well, I'm doing research on geoengineering, so I, I, um, I would say uh, parts of it are a very good idea, parts of it aren't. Um, the I it's not a solution to global warming. It's, it's a sticking plaster. Um, if it works, then what it's doing is holding back the warming rate of the atmosphere um, by reflecting more radiation out into space. Um, but it's not doing anything about the growth of CO2 in the atmosphere. And the, the pathway by which that CO2 damages the world if it's not causing warming because of geoengineering is by causing acidification of the ocean and with all the ghastly consequences that can come from that of killing off marine life and then having killed off marine life um, more carbon dioxide come uh, the, the carbon dioxide rate of growth in the atmosphere goes up because the, the ocean won't be able to absorb as much as it used to so so geoengineering is is a temporary sticking plaster that can hold back warming while we do something else and the something else would have to be finding ways to take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere but um, of the of the types of geoengineering the the one there's one that I firstly a lot of them don't work or won't work fast uh, rapidly enough uh, so all the benign methods of afforestation, for instance, will, will uh, take a long time to act. But of the ones that act fast, the, the bad one, I think, is, is spreading um, uh, its powders into the stratosphere um, because they, that is a, it spreads throughout the entire global stratosphere and it has an effect for a long time before it falls out. And so if there's unexpected effects occurring from, from the spreading that uh, aerosols into the stratosphere, there's nothing you can do about it until it's all fallen out. So if you, if you screw up the Indian monsoon, you, you just have to sit there until uh, your, your aerosol has gone away. But the, the method that I, that I like because I'm working on it is um, marine cloud brightening, which is where you, you pump um, finely, very fine uh, seawater through a very fine nozzle into the bottoms of clouds. That's the, the, into the, that's the miserable gray clouds that occupy about 40% of the planet. And it makes them brighter, if, as long as the nozzle is the right size. And the, the, uh, the seawater particles then evaporate giving you a, a very tiny crystals. And these crystals in the cloud make the cloud brighter. The cloud reflects more radiation and you get a cooling effect. So the, the advantage of that is that it's benign. Firstly, the, the public would accept uh, spraying clouds with water in a way where they wouldn't perhaps accept spraying the stratosphere with some poisonous chemical. Uh, and also, as soon as you, if you do something that screws the world up, which could easily, you could easily do, then you st if you stop pumping, it Im the, Im the effect stops immediately or nearly immediately. Whereas with aerosols, it, it lingers on for a long time. So you can, uh, you can correct your mistakes and uh, you, you, can, you can retreat if you've made a mistake with, with cloud brightening. So uh, I'm, I think... That particular type of geoengineering is, is something that uh, I think is, is, is a positive thing, um, but some of the other methods are either ineffective or harmful. Was, I, I may have missed, was the question geoengineering or genetic engineering? Geoengineering. Okay. okay. Um, when will we have an ice-free September in the Arctic, and when will we have an ice-free season of four to five months, and what are the consequences of a collapse of Arctic summer ice? Well, well I don't know, talk about that tomorrow, uh, but an ice-free September could happen really any, any year. The, the, the trend has been downwards 
for volume of ice in the summer to the point where it's, there's less than uh, a quarter. The, the volume of ice during the summer months is now less than a quarter of what it was 30 years ago. That's a mixture of reduced area and reduced thickness. Um, so if you extrapolate the trends, they all go to zero in, in very small number of years. So I would expect an ice-free September pretty soon, and then the, that will expand itself into an ice-free three or four months, um, a few, not many years after that. So we'll start to see an Arctic, which is like the Antarctic is at present. That is, there's, there's ice grows, you have a huge area of ice in the winter, and it all goes away in the summer. Um, so all the ice, or nearly all the ice, is less than one year old. So it's thinner and uh, less impressive looking than, than it used to be. Um, so I think that's, that's what is going to happen. Uh, and it's already, hap we're already seeing that trend, but the trend is actually at the moment leading towards less ice every month of the year. So rather than September disappearing and then the rest being the same, you're seeing September sort of hanging on, but the other months are all having record low areas of ice, so that, that the whole Arctic system is sort of winding down, but it's happening year-round rather than purely in the summer. And the consequences of that because are actually worldwide, and, and that was the, in, in my book I was trying to bring that out, that in the past, people would think, oh, well, ice disappears, sea ice disappears, well, so what? It's, uh, it's just an interesting curiosity. It's like the glacier on Kilimanjaro disappearing. It's, it's a shame, but no big deal. But in fact, the, the loss of that ice causes impacts which affect the whole world climate system. They, they increase the rate of warming of the whole planet because of the albedo effect they increase the rate of global sea level rise and uh, they increase the, the rate of emission of methane. So there's um, lots of big impacts on the planet as a whole arise from what seems to be a small effect of Arctic sea ice disappearing. So that's something we have to be really be aware of and I, so I was trying to bring some awareness of that in my book. And there are animals there like polar bears uh, that depend on the sea ice and certain um, algae that live on the underside of the sea ice, which is food for krill, which are food for whales. So the whole ecosystem there uh, is uh, in many ways dependent on the sea ice. Just a follow up, Peter, from your book. You say the risk of an Arctic seabed methane pulse is one of the greatest immediate risks facing the human race. Please explain what this means. Uh, please. Well, um, the, uh, the problem is that um, m methane is, is, is being emitted gradually from a lot of sources, including fracking, um, and from the decay of, of permafrost on land, but the biggest threat um, is coming from the continental shelf seas of the Arctic, that's the East Siberian Sea, Barents Sea, Kara Sea, all those very shallow seas to the north of Russia. Um, and while the Arctic Ocean is maybe 4,000 meters deep, like any other ocean, the, it's got the world's widest shelves which are only 50 to 100 meters deep. All this area um, was dry land at some point, um, but it acquired uh, permafrost, a, 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 coat, a, a permafrost layer which acts as a kind of cap because underneath the permafrost, there's a very thick layer of sediments that are full of methane waiting to come out. And the methane can't come out because the, the permafrost is a, acting as a cap over it. Now, that's, that was the way things were from the last ice age until about 10 years ago. 
And uh, 10 years ago, the, the summer retreat of the sea ice brought the, those shelf seas of the Russian Arctic, they made them open water in summer. So you had about two or three months of open water where the water would warm up. And the, that warmed water would reach the seabed and the permafrost starts to melt and disappear. So there's a, a rapid disappearance of seabed permafrost in the Russian Arctic seas, entirely due to the sea ice having retreated off there in summer. And that means that the permafrost is, is now not a cap anymore. The methane's coming out. And every year that people go there, they see more and more big plumes, like a, like a huge gas oil spill or oil blowout. Big areas, maybe a kilometer across, of bubbling methane coming out of the, and that, that methane is coming from the seabed. It reaches the surface and comes out of, into the atmosphere because the water is so shallow, it doesn't have time to dissolve. So um, a lot of people think this is a very, could be a very, very ser serious threat. That's all the people who work on it think is a very, very serious threat. But that threat's been downplayed by the uh, pan Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Um, and if it happened, um, and there was a very big eruption of methane, you could get a pulse which would give you a sudden increase in global temperatures of maybe 0.6 of a degree is what the models show. So <coughs> we're, we're worried about the temperature of the world warming by one and a half or two degrees, but it could be that just that little phenomenon of those shelf seas becoming ice-free and emitting their methane from their sediments could give us 0.6 of a degree in a couple of years, uh, just a sudden burst uh, that, and the consequences of that for would be pretty serious. Um, Jeffrey, from your book, um, for a state like Wyoming, whose economy benefits from the coal, oil, and natural gas industry, what influence do these industries have on the state's politicians, media, universities, scientific studies, and laws? Lots. <laughs> Lots of effects. They, um, so, you know, Wyoming is sort of a, um, a really good lens, if you will, to... I don't think there's anything that's sort of unique about Wyoming, except that um, we tend to focus, because we're so dependent on fossil fuels, we tend to sort of be a microcosm or a focused lens of what's happening everywhere else uh, in the nation. So about, a little background, about 70% of our state economy, of our, of our state income, uh, our legislative coffers comes from severance taxes and mineral royalty taxes. So about 70% of our state uh, funds are dependent on fossil fuels. And about 70% of the University of Wyoming, we only have one four-year university, about 70% of our budget comes from the state. So half, 50%, 50 cents on every dollar that flows into the university is flowing through oil, gas, and coal. Well, what that means, of course, is that um, we are in some ways, very reminiscent of what was going on in the early 20th century in company towns, right? And so we're, we are a company town. We're just a company town with very long streets. And so um, the dependence of the state on oil, gas, and coal is, is absolutely phenomenal. Um, and somebody, I don't remember who was talking about, maybe uh, about the, the importance of fear, right? And so if you're a state legislator and you're looking at um, you know, uh, an $800 million deficit in the education fund because of a relatively small drop in the price of, uh, or the income from coal, um, you're going to run scared. And it's, and I get it, um, although they certainly haven't worked very hard to diversify the economy because it was easy money. It was fast money, it was easy money, didn't take a whole lot of work. Um, you know, the, the oil, gas, and, and uh, uh, coal companies, you know, they negotiated very low taxes, but given the amount of, of um, natural resources they were extracting, um, it, it fueled the state. 
And so when you're that dependent upon an industry, and I don't care what industry it is, I mean, if it's automobiles in Detroit or whether it's aerospace industry in Seattle or whether it's the military industry in San Diego or whatever you want, right? But when you're that dependent on a single industry at the level of a town, a city, or an entire state, you're gonna have a very twisted set of politics. Um, and what it means is that um, the politicians, again, this is sort of that corporatocracy, right? The corporations and the government are sort of in it together. Um, there's a, there's a, in, a, a dependency, which means that regulations are gonna be relaxed. It means that certain studies are not gonna be done, certain studies are not gonna be funded. Um, and you know, agencies are gonna know that raising certain objections basically means that your agency will either not be funded or the director of your agency will not have a job. And so there's a great deal of uh, self-censorship, sort of, of knowing what's going to happen if you raise too loud of a voice. Um, and so it's, it's, a, um, it's very much like um, you know, a, a Midwestern company town um, you know, back in the early 1900s, where if the industry moved out, that was the end of the town. And so we're feeling that in Wyoming. And maybe to a certain extent, there's a, there's a bit of that feeling in, in other parts of in other parts of the United States that are that are also dependent on single industries on, on in particular on, on the energy industry um, and so it's um, it's it's insidious it's a it's a form of of sort of continual low-grade corruption every so often it, it, it raises its ugly head in a form of, of um, a fairly politically brutal form of censorship where scientists are fired, where art is destroyed, where teachers are told that they will not teach um, in the next generation science standards, they will not teach climate change in their classrooms. Um, and so it does pop out in, in explicit ways, but it's sort of that underlying sort of constant tone of, um, you know, don't rock the boat. And, uh, and, and that's, you know, in some ways it's that sort of, again, that insidious self-censorship of, of science, of art, and of education that, that to me is, is probably as deeply worrisome as sort of any of these, you know, terrible moments in which um, the censorship becomes explicit. What is ocean acidification? Is it increasing and how will we be affected by it? CO2 that we emit to the atmosphere, about one-third or one-fourth of it dissolves in the ocean. And this was initially looked at as good news because there's less up there and therefore we have less warming to expect for us. However, all that CO2 is now in the ocean and nobody initially thought this could do anything there. Well, the CO2 reacts in the ocean, forming carbonic acid and a bunch of other chemical reactions, and it ends up making the ocean more acidic. Now, the ocean water is not neutral water like fresh water. It's somewhat basic. It has a high pH. I, I guess I won't get into a whole thing about pH, but let's just say now the ocean is more acidic because of all the, the CO2 that's coming into it. And then the question is, so what? And the changed chemistry affects organisms that live there. Some of the organisms that are affected the most are organisms that build shells out of calcium carbonate. So corals are included there. Um, Mollusks like snails and oysters and clams and mussels are included there. Uh, tiny plankton uh, called forams are included there. There's a lot of, of marine animals that make shells out of calcium carbonate. And the formation of the shell is slowed down and impeded by this excess CO2 lower, uh, uh, increased acidity in the water. And uh, this came to light, I mean, people knew it theoretically, and, but they all thought, well, this is a future thing. But uh, about 10 years ago, 
uh, a uh, oyster farm in uh, Oregon was experiencing problems with the water. They were getting water from deeper water pumping up for their aquaculture facility. And uh, the baby oysters that are, the baby oysters swim around, they're tiny plankton, and then they have to make a shell and they have to attach, go down to the bottom and attach to grow up to be a regular oyster. And the process of forming shells was not happening, right? And they had a big failure for a couple of years. They brought in some scientists to figure out what the problem was. And the problem was that the water they were bringing in was too acidic. So um, there are other things that have been noticed. they are tiny snails that are part of the plankton. They're, they're tiny snails. And they have thin shells to begin with. And they're noticing uh, that their shells are now showing signs of pockmarks and, and being eroded away. So it's beginning to happen in certain animals. Uh, there's some observations in corals as well being affected in terms of shell formation. So that's the one that's gotten the most attention. There's other work that's been, do been done finding behavioral differences in a lot of different animals, in fishes and crabs, so forth. So uh, not just um, mollusks and shell, shelled animals. Um, the behavior that depends on the sense of smell is impaired. And for a lot of those animals, this is, there's a lot of important behaviors that depend on the sense of smell. Uh, detecting pr your food, detecting prey for many animals depends on odor. Detecting that there's predators coming around for, for a smaller organism also depends on the sense of smell. If you don't detect the predator there, you won't run away, which is the best thing to do, or hide or something. So um, that kind of behavior is impaired. Homing behavior and migration behavior is also very dependent on the sense of smell. And this is also impaired. So though up till now there has been more attention and, and and work and scientists looking at the issue of shell formation, I, I, I think in the end, the behavior changes, since it affects almost everything in the ocean, will have more profound effects in the long run than the shell formation. The shell formation problems will affect us directly if you like shellfish, if, if you like if you like them to eat or you like them to see them and watch them and so forth. Uh, and, and shellfish play important roles in the ecology of the marine environment. Is, censor is censorship in America the exclusive purview of conservatives and corporations? Uh. Go to, go to any campus in America and look at the, this, this, this rampant censorship going on in the name of inclusion. You know, I rest my case, it's disgraceful. Yeah, I would, I would say that censorship is, a, is a, a tool of power and whoever holds power will have an interest in silencing dissent and silencing questioning, silencing objections. And so in, in, in places where the left has power, the left is fully capable of engaging in censorship. And in places where the right has power, the right is fully capable of engaging in censorship. Um, and so I don't think it's a left-right. Um, you know, and actually, weirdly, this strikes me. Here's the silver lining of censorship, right? Um, is that it, it's not a partisan issue, right? I think it's a First Amendment issue. I think it's a human rights issue, free speech. Um, and so it's, it's the kind of an issue, weirdly, um, that, it, that in principle it seems like across the political spectrum everyone should be able to get behind, but in fact what happens is because of polarization we end up with maybe this thin middle being the only people who are passionate about protecting um, uh, free speech while from the left and the right um, we just see greater and greater amounts of, of silencing, intimidation, um, 
censorship going on. So it's a, uh, you know, in principle, it seems like it's a problem that we ought to be able to rally around in practice. We seem to be failing. Uh, I want to say another thing about this. Um, I think that we misunderstand what's going on on campus especially. The despotic behavior that we're seeing among the academic intellectual class uh, is really not about what it seems to be about. It's not about justice, it's not really about inclusion, and it's not about diversity. It's about the pleasure of coercion. It's about the pleasure of pushing people around. And that's what it's really about. And, and we gotta get serious and real about it and not pretend. What has been the result of increasing demand for seafood worldwide? And also, um, does aquaculture, the raising of marine organisms for food, negatively impact the oceans and lakes where they are grown? So the results of increasing demand for seafood worldwide is first part, the second part, does aquaculture, the raising of marine organisms for food, negatively impact the oceans and lakes where they are grown? Obviously, you take more fish and other living things out of the ocean at a rate beyond which their reproduction, beyond their reproductive rate, their populations go down. If you could get the right number to take out for for people, you can get a balance and get a what they call a sustainable yield. If you get the right number, you could take out a certain amount this year and still have the same amount available to take out next year and in perpetuity. But finding that number is very difficult and there's political arguments between the fishing industry and conservationists over where the number should be. The, the calculations to come up with the number are based on models. The models usually consider only the particular species that you're talking about. And don't consider the fact that this particular species you're looking at interacts with other species. And they have things that eat it, and there's things that it eats. And all of this is critical to coming up with the right number. And those ecosystem-based fishery management should be the goal. And a lot of, there's a lot of good words about it, but we don't really see it happening. People haven't figured out quite how to do it right. How, uh, going on about the aquaculture, the future of getting seafood is aquaculture. We are depleting the standard fishery uh, management is depleting many, many populations in the ocean. Um, and if you grow them, it's like the difference between hunter-gatherer hunter societies and agriculture. Agriculture, we know, has done a lot to feed people, but has also caused environmental problems, depending on how you do it. And it's the same thing with aquaculture. It can feed a lot of people, it can do a lot of good, but it depends on how you do it. And uh, there, unfortunately, has been some aquaculture that has gone the same way as the big agriculture in terms of using lots of chemicals, and this is not good. But, um, and, and also in terms of what are you gonna feed the fish that you're raising, you're gonna catch other fish out of the ocean to feed the fish that you're feeding if you're growing, let's say, salmon, a big, bigger predatory fish. And so the fish you're taking out would have otherwise fed fish in the ocean, but now they're feeding the fish in your aquaculture system. So the best kind of aquaculture, I think, is for shellfish. Shellfish, like oysters and clams and mussels, um, they are filter feeders. You don't have, you get them in good water with plankton, they're gonna eat the plankton out of the water. You don't have to feed them with anything. You don't have to use chemicals. Sea, the sea, shellfish and seaweed are the best kind of aquaculture in terms of 
having the least negative impacts on the environment and also in having some benefits, actually. So, does anybody want? I wonder if I could, um, I, I think we almost bumped into the elephant in the room there, right? And the elephant in the room is if we don't control the human population growth, it doesn't make a difference where we get our food, it doesn't make a difference whether we all drive a Prius. Um, there is no technological solution um, to our environmental and health problems if we don't gain control over the human population. There's a book several years ago um, by Dave Foreman called Man Swarm. And gosh, you know, there was this time where we talked about zero population growth. Um, and that, that has almost disappeared from the environmental discourse. Um, and Foreman suggests that it was this, uh, this strange collusion between the left and the right. From the left, we had this notion, well, wait a minute, who are we to tell the non-industrial world to have fewer babies, right? And from the right, it was, well, gosh, we've got to have more babies because we have to have more consumers because, gosh, we need economic growth. Um, and so it, the, the, the zero population sort of fell off the agenda through this weird, although from different directions, this weird collusion from the left and the right. And now we're talking lots and lots and lots about all kinds of clever technologies and, and ways to reduce climate change and how to grow food and whatnot. And damn it, I just don't hear a whole lot of talk about how we're gonna get control over the human population. I've got an idea. For every dollar that we put into GMOs, we put a dollar into zero population growth. For every dollar we put into solar energy, we put a dollar into zero population growth. If we match that dollar for dollar, our technology with, uh, against and that's the consumption side. If we, if we match it against the human growth side, then we might be on to something. I think it is a truly dismaying scene that you're describing, and um, it's basically true that we've lost interest in, in this. But I also think there's a parallel truth that we just can't really deal with, and, and that is the, uh, the probable, probable fact that there's not going to be any policy. There's not going to be any protocol about reproduction. We're not going to do anything about it. Um, you know, we're, we're going to reach the limits of uh, population overshoot, and then uh, you know the consequences of it will have its way with us. But this is related to an idea I introduced earlier before you arrived, which you know it, it's one of those sort of uh, conceits of the intellectual classes in America that, you know, if, if you can count enough things, you can control it. You know, if you can throw enough dollars at something, you can control it. This is something that is unlikely to be controlled by policy means. It's probably going to be controlled by the, the kind of forces that, that uh, for all time on the planet Earth have controlled populations. And that's going to be a scramble for the resources that support these populations. And it's going to be probably pretty ugly. Um, and uh, I don't think there's going to be a policy. So uh, let's not kid ourselves about it. I think it's very clear that in societies where women get rights and there's more equality there is in a society, the more options there are for women, the fewer children they have. And that's a way of reducing population growth without coercion. It's, it's the opposite. It's giving people, women, more rights. And that is a benefit for a lot of reasons, but also a benefit for reducing family size. Well, I'm going to agree to a large extent with you and suggest that the greatest moral challenge we face in the next 20 to 50 years is the just distribution of human suffering. Yes, I think we can remember back to 1972 when there was a, a very important book came out called Limits to Growth that where the Club of Rome did, did uh, this global dynamics. It was kind of crude modeling of what was happening to the world or what was going to happen to the world. But uh, it's still, it's actually stood the test of time. It's just that the, 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 the nasty things they <coughs> predicted took took a greater amount of time to happen than they thought but the the limits to one of the main things in the limits to growth was population uh, that we can't do anything really about everything else that's going wrong in the world 
as long as our population is growing in an unrestrained way. And um, the, the complacent view when that book came out was, um, was in fact, the editor of Nature went around making this point that there would be a demographic transition, that ev every third world nation would, would haul itself up by its own bootstraps. And when it reached a certain level of, uh, of affluence, then the people wouldn't want to have lots of children because they need to have lots of children to look after them in old age. So they would have fewer children uh, and so the world would correct itself. And the trouble is that what actually happened is more nations fell into extreme poverty than rose out of it. And, uh, and then that, so that demographic transition didn't happen except where it was in one or two countries like Singapore and, uh, or when it was forced like in China. So um, but at least people were considering population as one of the biggest problems then uh, before they had to actually consider climate change. But that, that in, in 72, people had only just started to measure carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. <laughs> so people were kind of innocently thinking well, its population is the biggest problem, and pollution was <coughs> another thing that was reckoned to be about to lay us low, and nobody worries about pollution now, um, and nobody seems to worry about population, but it, <coughs> it hasn't stopped being the same threat that it was in 1972. So it is, it is very odd how people's attention does, has strayed from some of the important things that we should be concerning ourselves with. <coughs> Okay, so assume that um, we could go on and there was significant environmental disturbances and problems going on. And assume that uh, a lot of these things are trending in the wrong direction. If you were fully in power and had full cooperation, and you were the head of the country, or the head of the world, and you could institute any policies with complete cooperation, as specifically as you can, not being general, what are the very specific things? So in other words, if, if the real truth about health was so powerful that we could influence all, th all of the world to do what we wanted, what are the very specific policies that you would put in place to bring the highest good for humanity and the environment and everything? What are the, as specific as you can, what policies would you put in place? Dare I start? Just to say, if if you wanted to minimise the interference that you're making by this kind of global dictator role with, with the people of the world, so that you just want to give them the best chance you can of of trying to build a better world, then I, I'd say that spend all the money that that you possibly can on research into finding a way to take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. Um, and then if you can do that, which it is scientifically possible and technically possible, but expensive, but if you spent all your money on a Manhattan-type project to, to find a, a way of direct capture of carbon dioxide, you then solved the greenhouse effect. So you've still got a million other problems but you've got one less, and uh, you, we don't, you wouldn't have to worry about climate change uh, anymore. So that's what I would say a, a dictator could do. He could at least spend all the world's scientific and technical resources on developing a way of taking CO2 out of the atmosphere and then let the world do its thing after that. Well, I'll venture to embarrass myself with the uh, solutions. And one thing is that uh, I think we make a mistake in even using the word solutions as uh, uh, capriciously and profitably uh, as, as we do. Um, a lot of these conditions d don't have solutions. They, uh, they're conditions that... Uh, their dilemmas, their quandaries, their predicaments, but they don't necessarily have solutions. So I encourage people to use the term intelligent response rather than solutions, because we're flattering ourselves to think that we're going to solve 
this problem. Um, I think that the trend, uh, uh, I really only have two basic things to say about this. I have a basic belief that uh, human societies are emergent phenomena and they respond to the conditions that present themselves at a certain time and place in history and uh, it, you know, to some extent events are in the driver's seat, not personalities. So um, we, our societies tend to adapt to the conditions as reality presents them. Uh, and we're not in control to the degree that we flatter ourselves uh, to think that we are. I do think that the major trend that we're looking at from the point of view of what can we do and what should our intelligent response be to this array of predicaments. The major trend is that we are facing a uh, epical contraction of the kind of human activity we've been used to for 200 years, namely a growing industrial society. We are going to face a contraction of that activity, a contraction of the ability to generate wealth. Uh, we're going to see a scramble for resources and a shortage of capital. There are no magic nostrums or techno uh, 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 miracles that are going to uh, serve as rescue remedies. But the major trend that we can recognize is we're going to have to downscale the activities that we do. All the activities that we do are going to have to be downscaled. We're going to have to do farming more modestly, uh, you know, even if it means we're going to grow less food. We're going to have to do, uh, uh, we're going to be doing less industrial activity. Uh, we're going to be, there are going to be fewer Walmarts. Uh, you know, I think we misunderstand many of the trends that are present right now, and we especially misunderstand the uh, uh, proposition that we can control them all. You know, we're going to have to roll with a lot of things that are going on. And there's so many of them, and there are so many of them that are truly beyond our control. So uh, uh, that, that would be my idea. You know, if we had a recognition in our society alone, forget about saving the rest of the world. You know, it's one of my pet peeves is that uh, Americans are so eager to be world savers and we can't even uh, fix our own country. But uh, uh, if we could recognize in this country the, the mission that we need to be on to downscale uh, the, the kind of activities we're doing <coughs> and change them, frankly, I think we're heading in a particular direction that I call going medieval. <coughs> I really believe that's going to be the outcome of the, the, the uh, fiasco of, of the industrial age. And, uh, you know, I think that's going to set the tone for, for the future. So uh, good luck getting there. It's going to be an interesting ride. Not to be a broken record, but... I agree, we need downscaling and probably the greatest need for downscaling is the downscaling of the human activity called baby making. Um, well, that's, it gets back to your overpopulation. Exactly, exactly, okay. yeah. Um, and I'm not sure that, that we need to downscale all human activity. Sex doesn't always make babies. Um, but there are, I mean, we are an acquisitive species, right? So what, hap what, what, what would happen if Instead of the number of cars and boats and square footage of our McMansions, um, we, we upscaled the number of friendships, the amount of art, music, and literature we produced. Right? So, so I don't know that we have to downscale necessarily the quality of human life as we might need to reconceptualize what it is to have a good life. And maybe it's not based on the amount of crap that we consume, but it's based on the number of relationships that that we manage to cultivate. And I guess if I'm, I'm in charge of the world, um, I think most of the things that we need to do, at least with human population as well as some of these other technologies, um, and this goes back to America saving everybody when we can't save ourselves, um, is I think we have to be both humble um, and courageous. And I, and I think that what we need oftentimes is culture-specific appropriate approaches. Um, 
and, and one approach everywhere is just not going to work. And to the extent that it works, it means that we've homogenized human societies. Um, and that's sort of a grim future as well, where everything is sort of, you know, mixed society. So I would like to see culturally specific appropriate means for reducing human populations, as well as for cultivating non-consumptive um, sorts of, of quality of life, which, uh, which is going to be post-industrial. It's going to be post-consumptive. Um, it's going to be a radical reconceptualization of what it is to have a good life. Um, I'm going to add something because I actually have thought of this and I actually have a solution that would have an <coughs> insanely radical effect on the planet. Um, I'm not sure you could get a, anyone to do it, but I think this would actually work if someone said, we absolutely, absolutely need a solution. I have a solution that would end diabetes, it would end heart disease, it would dramatically reduce almost every disease. It would end overfish overfishing, it would end factory farms. It would end land use problems, soil, transportation, chemicals, water, forest. All we would have to do is make it mandatory that every person has to sprout seeds and that's all they could eat. And then there would be no water use, there would be no land use, there'd be no chemicals, they wouldn't fish the oceans, people would have no health issues, and, you know, it would be interfering, but if everyone bought sprouting seeds and sprouted clover and onion and garlic seeds and three meals a day you sat there and ate sprouts, this would have the greatest possible impact that I could think of on everything. And even if it's bizarre of an idea, I actually think it would work if we were really that desperate, which it sounds like maybe we are. Well, can you start the Sproutocratic party? <laughs> Um, I'd like to ask another thing. Uh, a lot of times, you know, what, what happens is I'm very affected by what you say, but then I go into the real world and my friends say, what are you talking about? I just read, a, they, I just read in the newspaper, they did a scientific study and they said, whatever, that, some, that you know, chemicals are great, climate change is fake, whatever they say. Um, everyone, a lot of people don't believe a commercial from a breakfast cereal company but when they read in the newspaper that you know, it came from a, a science or research or a university, um, it seems like they feel like it's official. I mean, what's your opinion if you were, if someone's, well, what's your opinion on whether when something comes from the research or scientific community, should people assume that, oh, then that's true or is that also been hijacked by financial interests? My uh, former father-in-law was a, uh, uh, an IBM physicist, and his favorite book was How to Lie with Statistics. I guess if you asked me, would you believe a study on effects of oil pollution that was funded by the National Science Foundation and done at a university, or would you believe a study on effects of oil pollution done by people at Exxon? Um, I would believe the people in the university. Not to say the university scientists can't be dishonest, can't fudge their data. Some do. It, these things have come to light, instances in various aspects of scientific research, more often in the biomedical field, I think, than other fields, but I think the majority of scientists are honest and are interested in finding the truth and are doing studies to best find the truth. There are some bad apples, I, I acknowledge that. Um, I think, however, that the search for truth is corrupted when there's industry money involved, can be, not always, but when someone is funded by uh, an oil company, uh, there is pressure uh, to uh, find results more favorable to the oil company. And if you work for an oil company, your papers be, have to get reviewed by your higher ups. So. Um, you know, it's not a perfect world, but if you have university scientists, I think you have a better chance 
at honest people searching for the truth. Um, yes, I, I agree pretty strongly. Um, but th there are case of, cases, of course, where it's not so much that the university scientists are lying, um, but that there's a selectivity of the sort of research that can be done is research that is funded by somebody. And the bigger the, bigger the science, the, the, the more equipment you need, the more expensive it is, and the more it relies on somebody funding it. Um, so, for instance, I mean, in, in my field, uh, one of the big funding agencies for oceanographic research is the Office of Naval Research, weirdly enough. It's, it's the Department of Defense, but they've been much more generous towards oceanographic science than, than civilian agencies like the National Science Foundation. So if you're an ocean scientist, you tend to get your support from the Office of Naval Research. Uh, but of course, the Office of Naval Research has a duty to um, sponsor research that will help the, the, uh, the, the Navy to be able to uh, exert control over the oceans better. So, um, for instance, for many years, um, for, well, the, the Arctic group in the, in the Office of Naval Research, we suddenly, they said, oh, the, the problem that needs to be solved is how do ocean waves interact with sea ice? It's a very, uh, uh, it's a very pure science problem. And uh, so now we're going to give out lots of money so that people can go out and solve this problem. And it turned out, of course, the reason was that Russian submarines were, were, were using the sea ice to, to get around from, from the Arctic into the Atlantic and taking advantage of the, 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 the fact they were sheltered from the noise uh, the noise of waves of flows hitting each other sheltered the submarine, so that was their ulterior motive. But they, to, to 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 solve that, they sponsored a lot of research on waves in sea ice, which is a pure science. And the the scientists who did all that work were were getting their result. They 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 weren't lying. They were getting valid results. They were developing models and theories of wave ice interaction. And uh, it was a perfectly valid form of science. It's just that you wouldn't have done that if you hadn't been supported by the Office of Naval Research. You'd have done something else, which you thought maybe was more important for for understanding the ocean or, or our role in it. So um, it's the the selectivity of science is set by the funding agencies, and so that that in a sense distorts distorts science, although the individual studies that are done are done in an honest way. Uh, just a couple quick observations, and one is um, the amount of public funding that underwrites public universities has been in dramatic decline for the past 30 years, um, such that when we talk about a, a state university or public university, um, in most cases we're talking about an institution that's receiving probably less than a quarter of its funding um, through public sources, and more and more of that funding is coming through private sources. Private sources have interests, um, and those interests are going to be reflected in the practices, the questions that are asked um, by the institution. And, and I would agree. I mean, I would, I would definitely go still very much to a university scientist before I would go to a scientist from ExxonMobil. But one of the things that just amazes me is that, that two what, what you would think are two of the most, what would, should we say, conservative organizations on the planet, right? The insurance industry and the United States military, right? Have, have absolutely no doubt in terms of their behavior, their policies, and their practices that climate change is real, it's severe, and it has to be dealt with. Right, so you don't have to go to the to the university and, and sort of those those crazy hippie liberals, right? Just ask the insurance companies in the U.S. military whether climate change is real. But they believe the research from the universities that was done to get all the evidence to show that it's real, and we're caught. Okay, why don't each of you take up to five minutes to? 
give your closing thoughts on anything that you feel um, you would like to communicate to everyone regarding anything we've talked about tonight and anything else that's on your mind. Go ahead if anyone has any, any uh, final thoughts you want to sum up with it. Let everyone know. Give us your final thoughts. Yeah. My final thought is care about the ocean. It's most of our planet. Somebody had a picture of the photo uh, that was uh, shown from the moon when the astronauts first went to the moon, and they had the picture of the Earth. It's a blue planet. Care about the ocean. And, and I, I would say any time that a person frames any public institution, healthcare, education, military, um, or our nation, in, by using a business metaphor, be very, very worried. Uh, I, I really don't have any glib final wrap-ups. Uh, I've said enough, and uh, um, I'm a hopeful person, basically, and a cheerful person, despite the quandaries that we face. And, uh, you know, there was a lot of talk about hope in the 2008 election, and uh, it is a um, quality that most of us would feel very comfortable about having, uh, uh, possessing. We want to have hope. But uh, I think that the, there's an idea in our culture right now that hope comes from something outside of yourself and is given to you. You know, I'm going to give you hope. And that's not really how it works. How it works is you demonstrate to yourself that you're a competent uh, person capable of uh, uh, meeting the exigencies of your life. And you build your confidence into becoming a person who automatically uh, will, will uh, believe that they're capable. And they're capable of discharging their, o their obligations and, and taking care of the people that they love and the community that they're part of. And uh, you know what this really gets down to is the whole question of personal agency. And what are you going to do to, to try to make this a world that is worth caring about? Uh, yes, I, I'd agree and, and feel that there has to be hope and, and that there should be, because uh, there's always a possibility that, that the human race if we can't tackle our problems, we'll, we'll, we'll develop into some creature that can. I mean, we're, we're evolving all the time, mentally as well as physically, and the mental evolution of man through all the kind of uh, religious leaders in, in history gives people a new outlook, which hopefully is lead, can lead to a better way of, of dealing with the world and treating the world. And so I always try to be optimistic. In fact, I, I give a lecture course in uh, in Italy at the moment on climate change, and uh, and I don't I hadn't deliberately tried to be upbeat, but at the end of the lectures, the, the students would come up and say, "Prof, Prof," they always call, Italians always call <laughs> their leaders Prof. Prof, why, why do you look, when you describe these horrible things that are happening, why do you look so happy? And uh, so I say, well, that's because these horrible things, I'm not, I'm not going to live to see most of these horrible things, but you are. <laughs> um, we have time in case, oh, go ahead, Jeffrey. And then if anyone wants to ask a question from the audience, I was just going to riff on that. And, uh, you know, uh, from my perspective, and, and, and I've talked this over with, a number of people. I think there's very little reason for optimism and there's no excuse for hopelessness. Would anyone in the audience like to ask a question before we end? Anyone have a... Go ahead, can we get him a microphone? Um. I recently heard that 
one of the things that's happening with the um, melting of the permafrost is that um, some diseases from the past are being, um, you know, reborn, like the Black Plague, like the stuff that's been frozen for a long time. Is there any truth to that, or do you, can you speak on that at all? Uh, well, uh, the, the, it's based on kind of uh, salacious newspaper reports, but, but in fact, the, what they try to make out is that as the permafrost melts, then you've got uh, um, mammoths and mastodons coming, emerging, and, and if they had some ghastly disease, that will spread to the world. But actually, what's more likely is that there were people buried in the Arctic, especially victims of the gulag, who were just sort of buried in mass graves. And a lot of them died of, of very nasty diseases, including the, um, the, the, the 1918 flu epidemic. And um, so there were, that, that's more likely, if there's going to be a, a spread of an epidemic from for melting permafrost. It's, it's not, not going to be thousands of years old creatures. It's going to be tens of years old humans that, uh, that will be the source. Anyone else have a question? Go ahead. I think the audience has probably heard me say this, but I'm going to say it again. All four of you scoffed at the sprout example that Stephen gave. And, and you talked at length about consumption here. And uh, while eating sprouts 24-7 probably gets a little old, <coughs> the basic premise here is, and I know it's not the answer to all of these things, but I am concerned that the four of you, plus the other environmentalists that have been speaking, I've worked and I've been here, but most evenings, have been uh, reticent to mention the uh, facts that uh, if we eliminate animal agriculture, that goes a very long way to answering some of these questions we've talked about. And uh, animal culture, and fish culture, I should say that also, which is, um, I think, kind of scoffed over some of the uh, issues that the fish culture, lice and wild salmon and, and various other things, I'm not gonna go into the details. But here again, we are at this conference and we've talked about what's best for your health. And I feel, and I know some other people here, and I know that it's documented by facts that um, Animal agriculture is a really big consumption issue here. But thank you very much. Um, what are your thoughts about the common usage of an acceptance of phrases that seem to have become brainwashing mechanisms for by our unconscious acceptance of phrases in, um, in the US, especially of more is better and bigger is better, and how that stops, how those, those cliches that are unconsciously motivating people um, are contrary to the acceptance of what this gentleman was saying about um, the cultivation of, substituting the cultivation of, uh, of the things that we've done and substituting them with cultivating art and music and, and kindness and friendship and respect. Um, what do you think, how do we stop that kind of thing? And, and by the way, um, Steve, uh, more is better for sprouts wouldn't interfere with that at all. <laughs> That motivate the things that motivate us that stop us from looking to really solve problems can those be part of the words and the phrases that we seem to accept on an unconscious level or a subconscious level bigger is better more is better one neighbor has one car you got to have three 
um, one person has a 1997 car, you've got to absolutely hit that, bury that one. Um, the, the, what people are accepting is determined so much by phrases that we use. And, and, and it, it affects things like, it's so logical to, to cultivate art, music, build theaters, take people who are, are um, using their energy to put graffiti on buildings, take those people and have them make beautiful paintings on buildings like they did in Philadelphia a few years ago. There were 86 buildings, I'm sure there are more now, that have beautiful paintings on them, painted by, by people who were former graffiti felons. Yeah, that's a very interesting thing because I, you know, I've written about architecture and urban design for 25 years and uh, one of the things I noticed was that when the murals pop up in the town, what that really means is that you're not building enough n buildings that are beautiful, that are done, that are produced with artistry, uh, that 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 tell their own story as buildings. So that you're trying to compensate for them by by uh, you know painting uh, images on the walls of bad buildings that are essentially uh, you know they they perform the same role as televisions. You know, uh, 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 in this image crazy culture, one of the things that that um, you know y you can't fail to notice in the gym, for example, is you know where all these people are are covering themselves with tattoos, and um, it's like the people in this country are turning themselves into television, human televisions, who are broadcasting a story about their life. You know, this is my breakup with, you know. Josie, and this is, you know, when I won that silver medal, and, you know. So I, I don't think that putting uh, murals up in, in cities actually says a good thing about us. What it really says is that we're incapable of building cities that have true uh, architectural artistry. In Philadelphia... So it's paradoxical. In Philadelphia, these people were not... T build, they, they didn't have the ability to build new buildings, but they were commissioned by the Philadelphia yeah. and paid by, and by Philadelphia, and they were given self-respect, and that was making a positive use of, of talent that lies in many places that are un, is untapped. And in the 1600s and 1700s, if you've been in Germany, and I'm sure you have in France, and there are, are cities that have the most beautiful murals on their walls, beautiful paintings that are still respected to this day. And Not, well, those are mostly inside. No, they're outside. Uh, uh, they're beautiful paintings I must on the say outside. I, I, I don't like think Constance. I've ever seen them all over France and Italy. They're, they're and, and mostly in the United States. The, the mural, murals you're seeing are a psychological compensation for the fact that most of our buildings are shitty, most of our, most of our uh, towns are designed without any artistry whatsoever. A and one other thing about that, I, I want to bring to your attention, the immersive ugliness that is the common milieu for human life in the United States, is, it, you know, it's something, it represents something more than a mere aesthetic problem. What it really, uh, the immersive ugliness all around us is entropy made visible. And you're in the middle of it. And entropy is the force in the universe that takes things towards stasis and death. So it's, it actually makes a big difference. It's, it's important that we live in places that are completely unrewarding to us, that are, that are completely uh, 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 um, antagonistic to the human spirit. And so I'm not in favor of, of murals in, in American towns. I'd like to see good buildings. So, uh, so you, 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 oh, go ahead. I just want to get back to your question, which was about language and uh, why do the words that we use um, distort the way we behave? I, I was going to say an example of one of the worst phrases that should be used is sustainable growth. <laughs> you know, the word, uh, you know, Bill McKibben has a book that was titled Enough. All right. There's a word we don't seem to use very often. Um, you know, and what happened, wouldn't it be fun if every time somebody used the word bigger or better, we just substituted the word enough? Um, 
And, and I'm seeing that word now used with regard to debates about uh, gun deaths, d debates about, um, about consumption. Um, and so maybe a shift from bigger and better to the concept of enough. What is enough people? What is enough food? Right? What, what is enough square footage? Um, I, I think those are the questions. And I think, um, you know, there was that wonderful book, Small is Beautiful. I think enough is beautiful. Um, small is nice. Enough is beautiful. 